God so loved that he gave him. We all know the text. Jesus paid the ultimate price by his life and death. And Christ, through that whole process, has achieved even more than the recovery from the sin, or the ruin that brought sin. He did more than that. It was Satan's purpose to create an eternal separation. And desire of ages, it says. But in Christ we became more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. And taking our nature, the Savior has bound himself to humanity, but a tie that is never to be broken. Elaine? Philippians 2 8. Mm -hmm. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Right. It's amazing. These verses, read in the light of the great controversy we just talked about, have a profound meaning. And my prayer for each one that the Lord will fan the flame of passion for our God, our Lord and our Savior. Lucifer's accusations have been proven false. Game over, man. It's game over. Charges dismissed, case closed, the gavel is dropped. I thought about bringing my, my rubber mallet. I was going to bang on it. I said, no, that probably was not a good idea. I might scare somebody. The gavel is dropped. Now, this morning, I just want to talk to, talk to you a bit about the cost, the cost of being a disciple. This is what God, we just talk about what God has done for us. The cost of being a disciple. Jesus only asks of us what he in turn offers us. Which is pretty interesting. An attitude of humility. This posture of, of, of service and a willingness to sacrifice. And we'll be talking about those three things. This week, spent some time, or this past weeks, I've been spending time in and the desire of ages like I never have before, which I'm ashamed to say. I've never read the book through. I've read all kinds of it. It's marked up all over the place, but I've never read the book from front to back. But Jared, when he, when he we decided he wanted to, to have some Bible studies, Jared said, I want to know more about Jesus. I want to know more about God. And I, and I just want to study about God's life for now. And uh, so we decided, Jared and myself and Pastor, that the Desire of Age is a good place to go because you can read along with Scripture and get some insights <coughs> that just blow me away. I, and it really is blowing me away. I, I just, I just love it. And it, but I've been amazed when you think about the fact of how often Jesus was at odds with the scribes and Pharisees. Over and over and over, Jared. He's constantly... I don't know if want to use the word fighting, but he's constantly at odds with the scribes and Pharisees. And, and, and you look at this saying, you say, why was he? What was the problem? And I think it's because the religious leaders of, the time, of that time, okay, that they were constantly misrepresenting his father. Jesus hated that. If he had a hatred in his heart, it was a hatred for, for man misrepresenting Mis misrepresenting his father. You know what he did in the temple when he threw out the, the money changers because they had totally desecrated the temple, changed, you know, <clears throat> they were basically had stomped on the ground all the, all the meaning that was associated with the temple service. The Pharisees were just the opposite of what Jesus desired in a disciple. Just the opposite. On the extreme end of the spectrum, Jesus addressed some scathing remarks to the Pharisees in uh, Matthew 23 and Luke 11. I just want to read, just want to have, read a few. Laurie, Luke 11, 52. So apologies to Jamie, I'm going to read a bit here from the uh, NIV to protect my friend here in front of me. Woe well, unto you, experts in the law, King James' lawyers. Mm -hmm. For ye have taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering you hindered. Okay. And Daryl, you're going to read Matthew 23, 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! 
For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. And Jared, you were reading uh, Matthew 23, 4. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, that they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Not lift a finger to help. Not lift a finger. The Pharisees were elite and opportunistic. It was all about who? It was all about them. It was all about them, not about others. And they prayed in self-righteous contempt. You know, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Thank you that I'm not like other people. The Pharisees paraded their piety in public. Watch me, check this out. You know, look what I'm doing. Every time I'm up here, I have to thank the person who put that Kleenex box there. Our scripture passage this morning is in Luke 14. Let's give you a little background. It's January, and the Passover is in March. Jesus is three months out. Three months to completing his mission. He's on the final stretch. Okay? He's already spoken of his impending death, and the storm clouds are gathering, and the intensity is picking up. He's recently escaped stoning in Jerusalem, left Judea, withdrew to the region on the other side of the Jordan. The next time he enters Jerusalem, though, it will be triumphant. By the end of the week, the crucifixion will have taken place. Well, in Perea, Jesus is warned that Herod wants to kill him. Herod, the ruler of this region, we all know about him, who... Uh, a little over a year earlier, had, uh, had agreed to have John the Baptist killed and his head delivered to the daughter of Herodias, his wife. Jesus doesn't pay any attention to that, though. He says, don't tell that old fox. <laughs> and Gilbert, sorry, I meant to... T sorry, Gilbert, read that. want to read that, please? I just love this text. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, mm. Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? There is no, no fear whatsoever of Herod. You know? In fact, it's kind of funny because this is, this is kind of the way you expect sometimes we would talk. You know, tell that old goat. <laughs> Go here, I got something to tell him. Go tell that old goat. And I just, I just, I just, you know, this, this Jesus humanity is coming out of here. And it's kind of interesting. And uh, he wasn't intimidated. Today's threats to his life would turn to tomorrow's triumph over death on the cross. Cries out a litany of compassion for Jerusalem. In Luke 13, 34 and 35, Beth, sorry, uh, I'm going to read this one because I think, I remember I said I get mixed up and yeah, I gave you barbs because I couldn't find yours here. I don't know what happened. Somewhere between the basement and the living room and the church. Get, it get mixed up. Anyway, in, in, in Luke 13, 34 and 35, says, Oh, Jerusalem, okay, you stone the prophets sent to you, and how I desire to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. This is just before we start into chapter 14. Okay, so remember this text, because it's important, this particular text. Okay, we're going to come back to it a little bit later on. 